بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to lessons in fiqh we're still studying the times of salat the chapter that deals with time of salat and when is it possible for a person to pray a certain or particular prayer and when it is forbidden for him to pray a particular prayer. And we have a Hadith 137. And who will read it for us, Brother Mustafa? Narrated by Jubair bin Mut'im, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, O descendants of Abd Manaf, you must not prevent anyone who goes round this house, meaning the Kaaba, and prays here at any hour of the night or day that he wishes. Now this hadith falls in line with the previous hadiths that we have read because some of the hadiths tell us that it is forbidden for a person to pray in five particular times and those are right after Fajr prayer and just before the beginning of sunrise and from the beginning of sunrise until the sun has risen that is about 15 minutes of it and the third time is when the sun is at the center in the middle of this the sky where if you erect anything it would not have any shadow and this is about five to ten minutes interval and the fourth time is immediately after Asr prayer and just before the sun s starts to sit <clears throat> and the fifth and final time is when the sun itself starts to disappear until it disappears completely. So these are five times. It's forbidden for us to pray. And we've clarified this subject and we said that with the exception of the prayers that have a legitimate cause and reason. And, and this is the choice of Imam al-Shafi'i. May Allah have mercy on his soul. And of course it was also uh, the recommendation of Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Ibn al-Qayyim. May Allah have mercy on them all. So this is authentic uh, uh, opinion of all. I believe that uh, Mustafa has a question. Yes. Uh, does the Hayat al-Masjid, <coughs> is it included from the legitimate reasons of praying during a waqt al -Nahi? Of course. The Hayat al-Masjid means the salute that a person offers to a mosque, to a masjid when he enters. Because there's a hadith where the Prophet وسلم, told us that if any one of you enters a mosque, he must not sit down until he offers two rak'ah. And scholars say that the word itself, Tahiyat al Masjid, the name, the salute of the masjid, is not found anywhere in the Sunnah. So this is a, a, a terminology that has been given to any two rak'ahs offered in order for you to sit down. Nevertheless, though I'm going to uh, uh, divert a bit from answering your, your question, so if I divert too much, remind me. <clears throat> Those scholars say that if you enter a mosque and you offer two rak'ah as sunnah, for example, it's fajr prayer, and we all know that there are two rak'ahs sunnah, preferred prayer before the original obligatory prayer. So I come to the mosque, I offer these two rak'ahs. Now after finishing, shall I go and pray two more rak'ah for saluting the masjid? Scholars say, no, you don't. <clears throat>
because there is not a particular salah prayer that is called tahiyat al-masjid. The order or the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ is that you may not sit down until you pray. And to give you another example, what happens if a person comes into the masjid and they are praying in the congregation? They're praying the jama'ah. <clears throat> of course, definitely the first thing I would do is to join them. And what happens after the prayer has finished? Should I stand up and offer two rak'ah, tahiyyatul masjid? Scholars say there's no need. So the word itself, tahiyyatul masjid, is a terminology that some of the scholars looked at the hadith and, th and said, well, the Prophet said, do not sit down until you pray two rak'ah. So what, is, what are these two rak'ahs? Let's call them the salute of the masjid, tahiyyat al-masjid. Actually, there isn't anything as tahiyyat al-masjid. All that you have to do is pray, whether you pray sunnah, whether you pray the obligatory prayer, whether you pray uh, another sunnah, um, for example, uh, uh, salat al-istikhara, or, or the sunnah of ablution, you pray two rak'ah after performing ablution, it suffices, it's, it's enough. You, you can't immediately sit down. Now, coming back to your question, if a person enters a masjid and there is no sunnah to pray, there is no obligatory pr uh, prayer to pray, and he wants to sit down, so he has to pray these two rak'ahs uh, uh, in order for him to, sit, to be able to sit down. Otherwise, he would be sinful. And these two rak'ahs are exempted from the five times where it's forbidden for you to pray because they have a legitimate reason and cause. So it's like praying the funeral pray, uh, prayer. It's like praying the, uh, the, for when, when the sun eclipses and so on. Uh, the thing that I'd like to point out is that though there are these five times where you're denied from praying, it is also forbidden for you to pray whenever the congregation is on. <clears throat> and this is something a lot of the brothers don't do, don't know. And, and the best and clearest example of all is during Fajr prayer. A lot of the brothers come into the masjid, the Imam is praying Fajr, and because they left their houses without praying the Sunnah, they come into the mosque and pray on their own the Sunnah while the congregation is going on. So they try to finish two rak'ahs as fast as possible, and then they join the congregation. This is forbidden, and it's not accept acceptable. The two rak'ahs that they have prayed is void. It, it, it would not do. And the reason behind that is that the Prophet ﷺ said that whenever the obligatory prayer is on, whenever the obligatory prayer has been called for, no prayer is accepted except this particular prayer. So, again, this is a time, though it's not bound by a time interval, like the five times we have, it, but it is forbidden for us to pray when the congregational pr uh, prayer is on. Now, <clears throat> coming back to... Uh, okay, uh, Mustafa. I have a question. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> if you hear the Adhan, and then instead of praying the Sunnah in the Masjid, you pray it at home, and then you go down to the Masjid, do you pray those two rak'ahs, or you just like... What do you think, uh, Abu Malik? Well, the sunnah is to pray them at home. Yes, he did pray them home, but then he went to the masjid. So he's asking, what do I do now? <clears throat> well, if he enters the well, I assume if, uh, if they didn't begin the congregation pra you know, prayer, then uh, he can pray the two rakas tight, you know. He can, or he may, or he must. No, he must pray the two yes. rakas tight to masjid. That's the right and the correct answer. Because if you prayed the sunnah home, and you went to the masjid, you want to sit down, you are instructed by the Prophet ﷺ not to sit down until you pray two rak'ahs. Okay. I heard that uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, uh, for Fajr prayer, he just used to sit down and not pray if, uh, the two rak'ahs, if he prayed them at home. Well, with all due respect to your hearing, see, in, 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 in Islamic law, it's not a matter of word of mouth. It's not a matter of I heard. So this is point one that we have to clear out. Anyone could come in and say, 
Listen, I heard that uh, Shafi'i did this and that, but, but you have to prove it. It has to be written down, and you have to cross-examine that the, nar the narration, the chain, is correct, because you would open a book. You, there are hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of books, and you could open a book and it says, Shafi'i says so, Ahmad says so, Malik says so, and Abu Hanifa says so. But if you cross-reference, cross-examine, the, the, these uh, uh, um, sentences or statements to their own books, to the own school of thoughts books, original ones, you will not find them. So, point one, it's not enough that a person says, Imam Ahmad says, you have to have the credentials, you have to have the proof. Assuming that this is correct and true, let's assume that this was said by Imam Ahmad. Again, in Islam, we don't have uh, 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 the four apostles or uh, the four books mark luke uh, john and, and paul we don't we don't have these in islam imam ahmad imam malik imam shafi imam hanifa they are all on the top of our heads and they are all honored honorable uh, 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 scholars of islam yet all of them say whenever the hadith is authentic then throw my opinions and my sayings and take the hadith. So when we say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, we testify that the Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is Allah's servant and messenger. Which means that on the day of judgment, Allah will not tell us, Allah will not question us, why didn't you follow Abu Hanifa? Why didn't you follow Malik? He will ask you, why didn't you follow the words and the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam? Which means that the four schools of thought, the imams are knowledgeable people. But they have differences among themselves. This is based on the methodology they took their verdicts from the hadith. So one looked at it from this angle, the other looked at it from two angles, a third one had a hadith that the others did not know of, and that is why <clears throat> we follow them depending on their following the Quran and Sunnah because at their time they did not have any print houses that would print all these books that we have they didn't have uh, uh, internet they did not have uh, um, lots of things that we have and enjoy and they were deprived of they used to travel to from one area to the other to acquire one or two hadiths now, at the tip of, at the punch, you know, you just press a button and it lists for you ten thousands of hadith. And it tells you which is authentic and which is not through their knowledge and through their traveling. So, to uh, 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 wrap things up, you have to prove that this was said by the Imam. And if it was proven, then you have to cross examine it with the Quran and with the Sunnah. It is not something divine that. Imam Ahmed said, we, would ha we have to follow it. Uh, I believe that we have to pause for a short break, and inshallah, we will continue to talk about this subject. Closing the Gap Why closing the gap? In this program, Sheikh Yusuf Estes and Omar Dunlap are going to discuss how to bridge the gap between peoples of different cultures and orientations. The gap between males and females, Muslims and non-Muslims, the East and the West. Human beings feel like that they're being slighted one way or the other. The gap between the youth and the elders, the gap between various status in working, the work field and the education, and then trying to provide solutions for these particular problems. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah and welcome back. Just before the break, we were discussing uh, Brother Mustafa's question about a saying that he heard that Imam Ahmed says that it's okay if you pray Sunnah in your house to come to the masjid and sit down without 
Ukraine. And again, with all due respect to what you have heard or to the sheikhs that say this, it is a very simple uh, uh, process that we should follow to feel at ease. And this process is cross-examine whatever you hear with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So if we cross-examine what you have heard with the Qur'an and Sunnah, we will find that the Prophet says, والسلام, whoever enters a mosque must not sit down until he prays to Raqqa. So he did not mention unless you have prayed Sunnah home. And he did not mention unless this or that. He, it's, it's a general instruction that we should follow. And just to uh, add uh, an extra bit of information, the Prophet ﷺ was once delivering the khutbah of Jum'ah. And Sulaik al-Ghatafani, one of the companions, entered the mosque and sat down. So he told him, ﷺ, the Prophet, did you pray two rak'ahs? He interrupted the uh, uh, khutbah. Uh, and he stopped it, his speech, and asked this man, did you pray? The guy said, no, I did not. So he told him, stand up and pray two rak'ahs. Which shows you that, now the two rak'ahs are not sunnah, definitely, because does Jum'ah have any sunnah before it? Does it have any uh, sunnah afterwards? Yes. Kef no. How do you say no, Muhammad? Jum'ah, does Jum'ah has after? After, yes. How many rak'ahs? Four. Four. If you stay in the mosque. If you, if you perform them in the mosque, you pray four rak'ahs. But if you prefer, uh, perform them home, you pray, pray only two rak'ahs. This is the sunnah of Jum'ah. So this shows you that the, the sunnah for sitting down in the mosque, it is a must. That is why the Prophet interrupted his speech, salam, and asked him to perform it again. Uh, uh, Brother Fadi? Is it permissible, for instance, if someone uh, walks into the masjid after the Adhan of Fajr, performs the evolution, to pray the two rak'ahs, like to gather the intentions together, to pray, to pray two rak'at as a form of Tahit Masjid, and Sunnat al-Fajr, and Salat al-Stikhara, and... Sunnat al-Wudu. And Sunnat al-Wudu. Yes. Do, do you have anything left over <laughs> from a couple of weeks ago or yeah. so on? But yes, it is. It is. Now, preferable uh, uh, prayers, you can join uh, the intention. Uh, but as I said, d depending on the, uh, the joining, so if you are joining two preferred things, this may not do. For example, if you want to, to, to join the sunnah of Fajr, because now you're entering the mosque after the adhan, so you want to pray two rak'ahs of sunnah of the Fajr. And last night you did not pray Isha sunnah, two rak'ahs afterwards. So you say, okay, I'll join both and have the intention of both. This is not... Uh, permissible. But if you want to join these two rak'ahs with istikhara, istikhara, as, we, as you remember, is praying two rak'ahs and seeking the guidance of Allah to choose for you. You're asking Allah to choose for you. I want to buy a car. After half an hour, I'm going to the uh, showroom to buy a car. I've got the money in my pocket. I pray two rak'ahs and I ask Allah for, for guidance and I tell him, after praying two rak'ahs, oh Allah, if this buying the car is good for me in this life and it's good for me in, for my religion, then make things easy. And if it's not good for, my, for me in this life and it's not good for my religion, then distract me from it and decrease something that would be beneficial and make me feel happy with it. So this is Salat al-Istikhara. Now you can pray the Sunnah of Fajr or any other Sunnah which is recommended prayer, and join al-istikhara with it. Why? Because the Prophet said, والسلام, whoever wants to do something, he may pray two rak'ahs that are not obligatory. Any two rak'ahs. So he did not specify praying two rak'ahs for this reason, which means that any two rak'ahs would do, providing they're not obligatory prayer. So uh, to, uh, to put it in a nutshell, <clears throat> If you join two or three niyas at the same time in a prayer and there is no conflict among them, then it's okay. So if you pray Sunnat al-Fajr and you add to that Sunnat al-Wudu, the Sunnah you do after evolution, and you add to that Istikhara afterwards, it is okay to pray only 
to Raqqa. Noor, you had a question? I just have a little question. Yeah, question. Uh, connected, uh, we have to pray when we uh, come to the mosque before setting down. Is it become obligatory? So if we leave it or we miss it, uh, we are sinful? Or Yes, you are. See, again, remember, we talked about this uh, uh, a while ago. We said that there are five verdicts on everything we do. Either it's obligatory or forbidden. Recommended or not recommended or permissible. So whenever the Prophet says, Salam, do this, then this is obligatory. And whenever he says, do not do this, then it's forbidden. Other, unless there is something else to you know, make it a little bit weaker from obligatory to recommendable or from uh, forbidden to unrecommendable. But as it is, as it stands, the Prophet says, if you enter the mosque, do not sit down. So saying do not sit down means that it's forbidden. You may not sit down. You just said, if the Prophet said, do not do that, so this means, uh, or do that, then we have to do that. He says, do not do that, it's forbidden. Is it a rule that if he says, do this, then the opposite is, is forbidden? Like if he says, pray, so not praying is forbidden, right? Yes. So it's always a rule. Like if he says, yes, do this, it's then, a rule then of the thumb. opposite is... Unless there is something else, and this is usul al-fiqh, the fundamentals of fiqh. Unless there is a, something that is called qarina, that makes it lesser. For example, <clears throat> one of the easiest uh, uh, examples and, and the basics is the, when the Prophet wasallam says, I denied you before from visiting cemeteries. Now visit them because it reminds you of the hereafter. Now this visit them is an order. So one would think that this is obligatory. Scholars of, of fiqh say, no, it's not obligatory because... It followed a denial. It followed something that was forbidden. So whenever it is forbidden, and then it, it's made as an order, it goes back to how it was, which is permissible. Now, this is different than if the Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, grow your beards. Now, this is an instruction. It's an order. We look in the Hadith. We look in the Quran. There is no way where it says it's okay or it's preferable, or uh, it was uh, uh, forbidden in, in the before, and now it's, it became obligatory. So it's a clear and simple instruction, an order. So this means it is obligatory. When the Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, that these are forbidden for the males of my nation and permissible for the females, and he was carrying gold and silk. So this is forbidden. He says it's forbidden. No one comes to say, well, he, he was saying it's not recommended. He didn't mean actually forbidden. No, he said forbidden, then it is forbidden. We're drifting a bit, but so, okay. I hope it's the final question. Yeah, it's the final. So according to this rule, when the Prophet ﷺ said, grow your beards, then definitely according to this rule, not growing our beards is forbidden. It's a sin. It's a sin. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, but now... One has to be careful, you know, one, uh, sins vary. We have small sins, minor sins, and we have major sins. But if you look at them and classify them in this category, in mi minor and major, it would uh, encourage you to do the minor ones, and you will never know when you will cross the line and do the major ones. Because the more you do minor sins, the more easier it is for you to sin. No, the best way to look at it, not... In regard of minor and major, the best way is to look at who you are committing this sin. Who are you doing this awful act for? You are sinning and you are disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. So don't look at the magnitude or the size of the sin. Look at the magnitude of the, who, you, who you are disobeying. Going back to Hadith, Jubair ibn uh, Mut'am, which uh, Brother Mustafa has read to us, it tells us, the Hadith tells us that the Prophet is asking Bani Abd Manaf, the descendants of uh, uh, Abd Manaf, who were taking care of 
the holy mosque in Mecca. And he is telling them that you should not prevent anyone who goes around the house, the Kaaba, and prays at any hour of the night or day that he wishes. Which tells us that the Prophet indicated, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he indicated that any time of the day or night. Which means that if anyone prays, do not stop them. This tells us that the five times where it's denied for us to pray, there are exceptions. Otherwise, the Prophet would have told them, do not prevent anyone from praying unless he's praying in the five forbidden times. But by telling them, do not prevent people from praying, tells us that there are prayers that you may pray any time during the day or night, especially in, in Mecca, in Kaaba, after performing tawaf, such as Mustafa. Sunnah al-Tawaf. Sunnah al-Tawaf. What is Sunnah al-Tawaf, Noor? Sunnah al-Tawaf. You haven't been to Mecca, have you? Yeah, never. Inshallah, you will. Inshallah, you will. Fadi? Yes, you always pray to Rakat after you have completed seven times going around the Kaaba. Yes. Sunnah al-Tawaf is after you finish seven rounds around the Kaaba, you go behind Maqam Ibrahim. It's a place where Abraham, peace be upon him, stood to build the Kaaba. And it's, it's monumented over there. So you pray two rak'ahs there. This is Sunnat al-Tawaf, which means that whenever you perform tawaf, you usually, uh, it's a sunnah, that you, you pray these two rak'ahs. So the Prophet says, do not prevent anyone from praying at any given time, day or night, which tells us again that this is one of the, ex the, the, the evidence saying that these five times are not completely forbidden. On the contrary, there are exceptions, and these ex exceptions are known from the Sunnah and are known from the scholars uh, that taught us this. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program, so until we meet next time, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh.